Well, I work at the Bureau of Meteorology in the research and development branch. And so my presentation today, um, I want to just give you an overview of some of the recent advances that we've made in this space. And by seasonal forecasting, I'm talking about timescales beyond your typical weather forecast. And I'm going to introduce to you some um, things in terms of our move to dynamical models, and I'll explain to you what that means. Um, developing a capability to forecast multi-week timescales, forecasting extremes, and also then interfacing forecasts with applications. But I want to start with this slide because I think it gives the context. This shows weather and climate related risks associated with cherry production at different times of the year. But I'm sure all of you can think of similar risks associated with your particular area of horticulture. So for cherry production, a key risk is having rain at harvest time. So the question is, are there systems in place that can warn you of um, the chances of an undesirable weather or climate of event occurring? And then are there management decisions that you can make that can reduce the impact of that event or avoid that event, be it um, a heat wave, a frost event, or heavy rainfall? Now, some of the decisions that you make might require um, longer lead time or advanced warning. So for example, your strategic decisions like um, crop selection or choice of, of variety, you might require a season or more um, advanced warning of what the growing season is going to look like. Um, but then again, there are your more tactical decisions, your within season decisions like when are you going to harvest or um, managing your fertilizer application or irrigation demand or labor where you might need less advanced warning. So weather and climate obviously is only one component of your decision-making process. So to start off with, um, the current, what is the current seasonal outlook service that is offered by the Bureau? Well, there are forecasts for um, Australian temperature, maximum and minimum temperature and rainfall for the upcoming two months and for the upcoming season. And accompanied with those outlooks, um, there is a video. Um, and if you haven't yet watched those videos, I do recommend them. They're really informative. They explain the forecast, uh, the outlook really carefully, but then they also put it in the context of recent conditions. So explaining, well, you know, what is um, the drought condition like in Australia at the moment? What are the soil moisture conditions like? They're, they're also information about stream flow forecasts. So they're really informative and give a lot of background information. There are also forecasts associated with um, El Nino. So forecasts of sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean. And as you're probably aware, El Nino has a bit, um, the potential to have a big impact on Australian climate. There are also stream flow forecasts for a number of different catchments across Australia. And in the summer season, there are tropical cyclone outlooks. Now, since May 2013, the forecasts of Australian climate have been based on what we call a dynamical model. In the past, they were based on a statistical scheme. And what a statistical scheme means is what we did is we looked at what was the sea surface temperature doing in the, in the Pacific Ocean and in the Indian Ocean. And then we looked back in history and see, well, when those oceans are in those states, typically what would happen over Australia. And that's how a forecast would, make, would be made. That's not the case with dynamical models. Dynamical models are quite different. They are actually computer simulations of the weather. They simulate the weather every day. And they're based on those complicated physics equations like transfer of heat and momentum. And um, to run these models, it, they're really computationally expensive. They're very, very complicated, um, count complicated models. But these are the same models that are actually providing you with your weather forecasts. So we're now running them out further into the future to provide forecasts on the seasonal timescale. So this is an example of a forecast for the um, October to December season in 2013 when we had both of these systems running. And it's forecasting whether it's going to be drier or wetter um, in that season. And this is the forecast from the dynamical model. And this is the forecast from the statistical model. And you can actually see that they're forecasting quite different things. The dynamical model is saying that it's the chances are it's going to be dry than normal over eastern Australia, whereas the, statist the statistical model was saying that it was going to be wetter. So what actually did happen? Well, it actually ended up being drier than normal over eastern Australia. So in this case, the dynamical model actually was giving a better forecast. 
But when we decide whether or not we want to change our forecasting system, we don't just look at one case like this. We look at a lot of forecast cases in the past, and we see over all those forecast cases how accurate is, is the system. And so this shows the forecast accuracy, so how many times does the system get it right? If it says it's going to be above average rainfall, was it actually above average rainfall? So this is the, the accuracy in predicting the upcoming season's rainfall um, for the different seasons at the top from the dynamical model and at the bottom from the statistical model. And green here is better. So you can see in general, overall, the dynamical model was giving um, a greater accuracy of forecasts. And that led to the decision to um, upgrade the system. So a lot of our research is focused on continued improving these forecast systems that we're using. Now, a nice thing about using dynamical models is that they have the capability to provide us with forecasts on a whole range of timescales. And that's what's shown in this graph here. It's this concept of sort of seamless predictions, warnings, hours, days, weeks, months, seasons, and years out into the future. And the graph here is done um, from a perspective of disaster risk management, but you can imagine for horticulture, um, Decisions on different times, uh, you, you know, warnings at different timescales may be um, appropriate for different decisions that you might want to make. So um, you might, years in advance, you might want to know whether or not a particular area is suitable for a particular crop, for example. Um, the other thing about this is that as you make forecasts going further out into the future, the uncertainty associated with those forecasts increases. Um, and that is true even if you have the perfect model. So even if we have a perfect model, nature is what we call chaotic. So there's always going to be uncertainty. So what that means is that for a weather forecast, we might be able to say that in two days' time at the Gold Coast, there's going to be forecasting a maximum of 23 degrees. We can't do that scientifically for a period beyond um, a weather forecast. It doesn't make scientific sense. Beyond a weather forecast, what we have to do is our forecasts have to be what we call probabilistic. They have to show that there is uncertainty associated with that. And so we would do things like say there's a 70% chance of something happening. Now, the Bureau has been providing weather forecasts um, since the early 1900s and seasonal outlooks since 1989, but there's um, a gap, sorry, there's a gap in this prediction capability beyond the weather forecast and shorter than in the season. So what's going to happen in the next few weeks? And that's what we call multi-week or sub-seasonal, intra-seasonal. And we've been doing a lot of research in the last few years in trying to provide forecasts on that time scale. And a lot of that interest has come from the agricultural sector. And so with that research, um, what we do is we try and understand um, our climate system. And this slide just shows some of the important climate drivers that we know are important for um, Australian climate variability. So for example, I'm sure you're familiar with El Nino and you might be f familiar with the Indian Ocean Dipole. And we look in our models and we see, well, is the model, for example, able to capture the mechanism associated with El Nino? And then we look and see, well, how well can our models actually forecast it? And can our models forecast the link between El Nino and Australian climate? And then over and above this sort of underpinning science, we develop a whole range of experimental um, forecast products, which we then test, um, evaluate, and we trial. Um, this is just an example of one. It's showing the probability that an um, week two, so the week beyond the weather forecast is going to be wetter, um, neutral or drier than normal. But you can see from this sort of drop down menu that we're actually not looking just at week two, we're looking well, what's going to happen the week after that or in the month and then out seasons into the future. So this concept of you know, seamless, what's going to happen um, in the next um, time. And we also have those products going back for many cases like over the th past 30 years. So we can see, well, how well did our, our model do under different circumstances? Um, so we try and understand our forecast system, try and understand when the times are that it does actually have good accuracy and when are the times when it doesn't have good accuracy. Because that can help us then be able to communicate to the users when it is good to follow the forecast guidance. Um, one set of experimental products that we've been working on and also the underpinning research is forecasting extremes because clearly extremes are the thing that have the big impact 
on society. And I'm just going to show you one aspect of the extremes research, and that is forecasting heat waves. Now, I don't know how many of you are aware, the last two summer seasons, the Bureau has been trialing a heat wave warning forecast for weather forecast timescales. And these just show um, heat wave warnings that went out to the public in November last year. If you remember, in this period um, of November last year, there was a, a large heat wave over eastern Australia. This shows the maximum temperature anomalies. And so this heat wave warning um, product shows where there's going to be a low intensity heat wave, a severe heat wave, or an extreme heat wave. And this um, November 2014 heat wave had a big impact on horticulture, um, particularly in the Gatton region. Um, you can see here an image of sweet corn cobs blanking, so missing kernels, um, capsicum fruit being burnt, um, wilting leaves exposing the fruit um, for sunburn. Uh, this is a graph from a um, research station in Gatton, um, six different capsicum plots um, that were harvested at the end of November, and um, it shows a really high percentage of the fruit that were unmarketable due to sunburn, so up to sort of 40%. So the question is, can we provide you with more advanced warning than just seven-day weather forecast of these heat waves? So this is showing that this is just the case study of this heat, of this heat wave period. So this is a two-week period the, of the heat wave, um, 13th to the 26th of November. And this is showing what was actually observed. So the light yellow areas, at some stage in that two-week period, um, and a heat wave was experienced. And for the dark orange um, colors, at some stage, um, a severe heat wave occurred. So this is um, the forecast product that we developed. And it, this is showing now um, a forecast that was issued on the 30th of um, October, so two weeks in advance of that heat wave period. Um, and remember, I said to you that the products at this time scale have to be probabilistic, so it's showing this is the chance that you're going to get a low intensity heat wave, this is the chance that you're going to get a severe heat wave, and this is the chance of an extreme. So even two weeks prior to that period of interest, it's showing um, that there is a chance that you're going to get a severe heat wave over parts of northern and um, eastern Australia as it actually eventuates. And if we come closer in time, one week in advance, those probabilities are starting to get stronger, and there's clear indication that there's an upcoming heat wave. And then again, for the actual time before the heat wave, um, some of the models are even suggesting that there could have been an extreme um, heat wave. So a lot of our research is actually focusing now on being able to forecast these extreme events. Another aspect of our work is interfacing our forecasts with applications. Um, and we have a number, of, a range of different products um, and, and research projects. So for example, we do a lot of work in the marine space where we're forecasting ocean temperatures and they use it to um, input into um, southern bluefin tuna habitat zones which then inform quota management. Um, so there are a lot of projects like this. Um, I'm just going to show you one example that's relevant to agriculture um, and that is when we interface our um, forecasts to crop models. And this is an example of a crop modeling study um, for managing a wheat farm in southwest WA. And it's quite complicated, so I'm just going to step you through it. So the, so the management decision here was application of fertilizer. Um, the graph here, the triangles at the bottom, show the years where rainfall was drier than normal. The crosses show years when the model got the forecast wrong. So in actual fact, out of these 27 years, the model got the forecast right in 19 of those years. So we say it has a 70% accuracy. So what the graph is showing is your gross margin profit under two different scenarios. The green bars show the scenario where you don't take any um, forecast information into account. In other words, you just apply your usual uh, constant fertilizer strategy. The blue bars show um, the scenario under which you um, you use the forecast information. If the forecast is saying that there's going to be more rainfall than normal, then you would apply more fertilizer. If it said it was going to be drier than normal, then you would not. And so what you can see is a number of things. First of all, there are times when the forecast is wrong, and that results in um, economic losses. 
However, those short-term risks are outweighed by the long-term benefit of actually using the forecast over a long period of time, and that's summarized in this table here. Um, so essentially, using seasonal forecasts is a little bit like investing in the stock exchange. It's not something that you're in for um, the short term. You have to use it probably over a few years to be able to demonstrate the benefit of using it. So just to end off, um, just to give you an idea of what we're working on at the moment, um, we've got this dynamical model system, but we're now working on improving it. We want to make our forecasts more locally relevant to you and more um, usable. Uh, we want, we're also improving, actually, the model. Uh, so with these models, they have well, like grid boxes over the whole of the world. And our current model is grid box resolution is um, 250 kilometers. So this uh, map here shows you what a 250 kilometer resolution model looks like in terms of the topography over Australia. The new model that we're working on has a 60 kilometer resolution. So you can see with that increase in resolution, you, you much better resolve um, the Great Dividing Range, the coastal strip. And what that means is it feeds in better to being able, to, more better to be able to simulate rainfall and hopefully better predictions. And what's very exciting is that we have a Horticulture Innovation Australia project, which is involved in looking at um, how this new forecast system that we're developing um, might benefit um, horticulture, regions that are important for horticulture. So finally, um, we focus a lot of improved modeling. We want to make our forecasts um, more localized um, and more usable. We want to be able to provide better estimates of risk and uncertainty associated with those forecasts. Um, we're looking at providing different forecast products and interfacing with new applications. So I mentioned this sort of multi-week forecasts. Um, and really, in terms of new products, um, going forward, partnerships are really key. So it's really exciting, as I said, that we have this new relationship with horticulture um, because you know, in the future, for our forecast to be really usable and relevant to different industries, um, having those partnerships means that we can maybe um, work towards tailoring products that actually um, are relevant to your particular industry. And then there's what we're working towards is this concept of seamless prediction. So forecast and predictions over a whole range of timescales that can help you better be able to prepare, better be able to manage your risks um, and be prepared for future conditions. Thank you.